and welcome everybody. And um, so this is um, tips of um, uh, surgical FY1. My name is Kim, and um, here with me I've got um, Taz, and we're we're both hello. We're both um, up to from Black Hole, <laughs> and thank you, Sasha, for um, chairing this session. Um, so before we begin, um, I've posted a link um, down below in the chat box. I don't know whether um, you'd be able to see it, but I'm going to post it again. So um, if you are watching this from a laptop, get out your um, mobile phone um, or um, just click the link and then it will show a Google form for a pre-session survey. Um, and also log in to the interactive platform um, on Slido. So we'll be doing some po um, polls um, throughout the whole presentation. Hopefully it'll be interactive and fun. So let's um, begin. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I don't know whether it be it let us do a full screen. If not, then we just do um, the slides without the screen. OK. so. Here we go. Right. Um, so I've introduced myself. So um, Taz, do you want to, you know, um, introduce yourself as well before we start off? Yeah, so my name is Taz. I'm one of the F2 doctors um, currently working in Blackpool as well. Um, alongside Kim, we're actually at the same hospital. Um, we're both on psychiatry at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's about it, to be honest. And um, we're, about, we're going to talk today about um, tips in surgical, uh, being a surgical FY1, um, sort of just walk you through um, what, it, what our experiences were like. Okay. So take it away, Kim. Okay, thank you. So if you can't access the um, link, there is a QR code which you can access um, through the screen. Um, it basically takes you to a survey and it takes less than five minutes for you to do um, the whole thing. So, um, this is the QR for the Slido interactive platform, which we will try to use. Hopefully, there's no technical problems. Okay. Right. So, what is this? Kim, can you, Sorry? Can you put your um, slide full, full screen? screen? Let's try that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, is that showing full screen? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Right, so what is this about? So we'll start off with why surgery. You'll probably be sick of um, why surgery for now if you've been um, hovering over the surgical hub um, during the morning and the afternoon sessions. Um, so I will just really um, whiz through it. Um, and then we'll go into tips of surviving um, a surgical posting as an FY1. You've listened to surgeons, you've listened to registrar. So um, we're going to give you um, our two cents on um, surgical posting as an, a foundation doctor, basically the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, also, Taz will be sharing his experience of a surgical posting during COVID-19 pandemic. He spent a good eight months um, in surgery, so he, he's the best candidate to talk about that. And also his um, special interest in radiology. And so we're going to do some basic um, discussion on radiology. And then um, you probably, if you stay with the previous talk, um, um, you probably know sort of like uh, what, what to expect in the training pathway in UK, but we're going to go through that um, from a, a FY1, FY2 point of view. And also if you've got questions about MRCS part A and part B, um, and we haven't gone into details in the morning, and um, we are here to answer the questions as well, and how to get ahead in surgery in earlier stages of your career. So um, let's kick off um, with a video task. I'm going to need you to feedback because I can't see the platform if the video is working. Yeah. I'm going to play the video now and watch really closely because there will be a question on the video by the end of this. Okay. Is it playing all right? Uh, yes. Okay. So this is um, a video um, that I've made two years ago about a blueberry. And um, I just one day I just decided to dissect my blueberry. I wanted to sterilize my blueberry, so I removed the seed. And um, you can see that I, I've done it in a theater. I've draped it, sterilized it, and then um, we are 
currently suturing um, the sterilized blueberry back and then um, dried it up with a swab and then dress um, the blueberry and then voila, um, the blueberry is safe. So why surgery? I think a lot of us um, have that sort of impression that doing surgery means you'd be standing in a theater for a few hours working on dissecting your patients, you know, removing the parts that you don't want, keeping the parts that you want, but it's actually um, beyond um, just spending hours in theater. Um, patient selection is so important. You probably heard it over and over again. It's about using your knowledge and your skills to select the right patient. Not everybody has the privilege to undergo surgery because um, basically um, having to undergo a surgery is a major trauma to the body. If you've not got the resources um, to recover, you're basically not a good candidate for surgery. And also, um, you know, having a surgery career means you've got to um, not only diagnose your patient, not only select your patient, not only perform the surgery itself, you have to um, follow through the recovery process, observing your patient on ward and make sure that they go back to their baseline um, before the surgery. And after that, you'll be following that, them up in outpatient clinics. So it's a ongoing, an ongoing process. It's not only just that snapshot that you're doing something glamorous in the theatre. Um, it's basically dealing with really um, specialised group of patients. And, um, you know, in surgery, you will need to be very concise and precise on, you know, the things that um, you're dealing with. And you tend to be really good at it um, once you've got enough practice and knowledge and experience. So, so um, yeah, um, I was um, I was at um, the previous talk and um, before and listening to aspiring surgeons and very very experienced surgeons and their talks about um, you know their experiences in surgery. So you basically by now should have a very good idea what surgery is about. So let's try and see whether the poll is working. Has everybody logged into Slido? Is that, yeah, is that working? So um, once you log in and um, the page, it'll ask you to um, input your email and then you'll be brought into the platform and then just scroll down and look for our talk, which is the survival tip for FY1. Yep, are we able to get there? So I'm gonna share the screen and we're gonna see and um, the first question currently we've only got three of and um, the participants log in are we having some technical difficulty at the moment sasha has kindly shared the um link again yep so we're going to give you a bit of a time to log in, just input your email and you should be able to access um, our platform, which will bring you to the first question. Are we all in? Which do we select? Um, you, you select have to scroll the, all the way down, um, all the way down to Surgical Hub Life as a Surgical F1. It's uh, like a turquoise circle. It's towards Is the it end. The survival tips for FY. Yeah, um, yeah. It's labeled as um, life as a surgical FY one. So surgical hub yeah. life as a FY one. You should be able to see the first question. What is the size slash number of scalpel blade used in the video? Okay. And if you are there, just click on the answer and I'll be sharing the screen now. Okay. Right, so um, let's go to present, no share. Okay, can you all see the screen? We can see the screen. Okay. So, um, 
I'm aware that, you know, we still have a bit to go through the slide, so I'm going to share the answers now. So let's see the result. And so what do you think? Number 11, good guess. And we've got 17% for um, number 10 and 17% for 15. We've got another um, 10. We've got, okay. Seems that people want to put number 11. <laughs> okay, right, I'm going to show the answer. Um, so it was the number 15 and blade that was used in the video. Um, I was being very, oh, okay, we've got more answers coming in. Um, yeah, I was being, um, it was a tricky question, um, but this is just a test question. So um, don't be put off by it. Okay, um, so, Going back to the, oh, going back to the slide, just here and here. Okay, sharing. Okay, so tips of surviving a surgical posting as an FY1. What do you expect to do um, as a surgical FY1 on your surgical posting? So basic stuff, you're gonna clock in patient, you're gonna do medication reconciliation. And what that means is that you're gonna um, look through what the patient's regular medications and stop the ones they're not meant to be on and start on the ones they are. Um, you're going to prescribe IV fluid and it is a basic yet very challenging um, task to um, prescribe the right fluids for the patients. Um, you're going to request scans and investigations and chase them up. So if there's any abnormalities you spotted in the scans and blood results, it's your responsibility to escalate it um, to your seniors or and correct them if you not know the right treatment for you know high potassium, low potassium, and so on and so forth. And you'd be expect um, to expected to do lots of procedures like venipuncture, cannulation, and um, insert an NG tube and um, blood transfusion sometimes. Um, and you are the clock during the ward round. You'd be following your consultants and documenting whatever they say to the patient. Um, and um, it's your role to update the handover list as well and to make sure that there's a safe handover to the night team. It's also your role to refer patients to different specialties, um, you know, medical specialty and um, pediatrics, um, ONG, and also after the patient's then safe to discharge and um, you are the one to do their discharge medications and letters. Of course, you're not on your own. You've got lots of different MDT to help you with, you know, the pharmacies, the OT, the PT, um, your seniors, they will be around. And also the juicy bit. And um, so I'm, I don't know about um, yourself, but um, some of us want to do proper doctor stuff. So you'd be asked to accept, assess um, unwell patients. So you probably hear um, A, B, C, D a lot of the times um, during this conference. So what are they? A, airway, make sure the patient, you know, have a patent airway because that is what kills the patient at first. Um, B, breathing, whether they're having some, you know, chest infection going on, some clots in the lungs that is depleting their oxygen in their lungs and therefore putting them in the oxygen deprived state. Um, C, circulation, is their blood pressure working? Is their heart pumping normally? and um, any other concerns and they're losing bloods or they are overloaded with fluids because you've prescribed too much. D, disability basically means whether your patient's neurological function is functioning. Um, their GCS, um, APU sometimes, um, which is quicker to access, and also whether they are um, having normal blood sugar level. E, exposure and everything else basically means, you know, um, everything else, you know, their medical chart, um, if they're having um, pain in the tummy, um, if they're um, hypo or hyperthermia, meaning the temperatures are too high for the normal body. Um, 
those are the things that we go through when we are assessing unwell patients. Um, common surgical scenarios that you'd be expecting to see on board, um, post-operative review, um, they normally present with um, nauseousness, vomiting, um, pain control, and they might have fever as a reaction to the surgery itself or um, infection. So think infection, sepsis, um, hypovolemia, post-surgical complications, whether they are having any blood clots in their calves, you know, DVT, um, or um, it's circulated into the lungs, which is life-threatening, um, whether they're having some wound complications, you know, um, wounds not healing well or not healing at all, and bleeding from the wound, infection um, on the wound. And so some of the useful revision you can do before you start your FY1 as a surgical um, doctor, um, brush out on your fluid prescription, um, brush out on your electrolytes requirement um, for your patients, um, analgesia, what can you play with the WHO ladder, um, your um, VTE and um, prophylaxis and doses, what's their indication and how do you know whether patients um, on different doses of VTE and um, anticoagulant management, basically the same thing and some interpretation of simple um, investigation and um, Taz will talk about the um, radiology part later on. So, um, and you, if you are fortunate enough to be scheduled for theatre, there are certain things that you need to know. So, um, you can um, participate in theatres as a medical student. You don't have to be an F11 to start your theatre experience journey. Um, but some of the recommendation is you have to be proactive and ask for the things you like to learn because um, it is a very competitive environment in surgery. Once you're in theatre, you basically be competing with FYs and um, uh, foundation doctors and um, registrar for um, to do something in theatre um, instead of just standing um, as a bystander. And um, if you are interested, um, introduce yourself to the staff members, let them know, let them see your face. And um, of course, we'd be wearing masks nowadays, so it's very difficult to recognize um, anybody. Um, ask if you are unsure. This is really, really important because um, it's not a playground. Um, we have strict rules in theatre. You have to maintain um, sterility um, for your patient's safety and it definitely prevents infection if these rules are um, being followed strictly. So ask if you are not sure. On the general rule, basically anything blue is sterile. Don't touch them if you're not sterile. If you're not scrubbing, don't touch them. Um, inform if you're feeling unwell. It's very, very common for junior doctors or medical students to suddenly feel sick and at sight of you know, body parts and organs. Voice it out, don't be shy just because you are scrub up and it's, it, it's very um, difficult for you to unscrub, but don't be shy and to tell the person next to you that I'm feeling unwell, I need to de-scrub and I need to sit down and the um, theatre staff are normally very considerate, they, they've seen it all, so um, don't be afraid to voice up. Um, use your break wisely because once you scrub out, expect to be near by mouth for the next two to four hours until your consultant allows you to de-scrub. But also, um, if you really need to go on a break, just let um, the consultant know about it and um, you can de-scrub and re-scrub later on um, once you've done um, whatever you need to do. So um, scrubbing, you don't know how to do it, ask anybody around in theatre to show you one, two, three times until you get it right. It's so important for you to know how to scrub um, so that you know you follow the, the effective hand washing, the right sequence and um, to decrease infection rate. Um, and what to expect in theatre, what can you do as a medical student or a foundation doctor? You'll be holding retractors, it's a very important job because your consultant wants to have a good view of whatever they're operating on. Um, you can cut stitches um, if they trust you to do it. 
and um, if you're more experienced they might give you the suction and you know it's about supporting the team and being part of the um, operation as well it helps you to build up confidence and you get that experience as a surgical trainee before you even enter the surgical career and if you practice outside theater you can request to perform suture as well and if your registrar um, you know is um, kind enough and um, he might let you to do one or two and um, during your first times and then when you know you build up that trust and that rapport you might be able to do the whole suturing the closing suture on your own supervised and um, if you are considering a career in um, surgery do a lot book if you're a medical student you can't um, access e logbook just yet and um, you know you can just tabulate everything um, about the surgery in uh, um, Excel form and next time you can use it um, to your advantage when you're applying for CST it does work and um, so some of the details that you need to include would be you know the type of surgery date of surgery which consultant what the surgery is is that elective is that um, emergency and what complications which hospital you're doing it and uh, ID number, not the patient's name, but ID number of the patient, just to show that you've been part of the surgery. Um, it's, it's a form of evidence when you use it for your um, training um, application. So if it's a day case, um, you are the one who's in charge of the discharge letter. And so after your um, surgeons document that, you know, the surgical procedure, you are the one who eventually have to do the discharge letter like you do on wards. So before I hand the mic to Tas, I do think we have some other posts um, about um, what I've just said. So let's see how many of you actually listened. Um, okay, so if we can go back to Slido. And if everything, everybody's ready, then we will. So for the people who's just joined us, um, we are using a inter an interactive platform called the Slido. And I will post the link again. Yep, thank you. Um, and you can click on the Slido interactive platform. And we are going there. And we are just um, looking at um, some pose. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, okay, so we're going to the next question. Okay, so um, burnout, emotional exhaustion, I'm pretty sure um, different talks throughout the whole day we've been, um, you know, talking about, you know, a lot of people having um, burnout and um, in surgery is definitely um, one of the um, specialty with the higher burnout rates because it's very competitive, it's very stressful sometimes um, and you'd be expecting to put hours and hours in your training and to gather um, surgical experiences because practice makes perfect. Right, um, so if you can log in and to the platform basically screw, enter your email and you'd be um, directed to the healthcare life and scroll down all the way to um, surgical hub as you can see on the screen and life as a surgical fy1 so click on that and you'd be and directed to this question. So our question um, is, what is the burnout slash emotional exhaustion rate among doctors in UK in 2019? So if we are ready, I'm gonna show you the answers. Okay. Right, so this is what um, our participants um, have um, chosen. Okay, so I'm gonna review the answer so it's 54 percent it's not 67 but 54 is probably high enough and um, given that half of us actually experience burnout and exhaustion um rate among doctors it's not just surgical doctors but um doctors as an overall in uk so it's very important that you um find your support um you know whichever level or stage you are in your career 
Okay, next question. Um, which of the following do I find most challenging? And so we've got making referrals to other specialties. So this is um, FY1 level. If you are not um, a foundation doctor, you are a medical student, and you know, just imagine yourself as being a doctor, which part of your job would you find uh, most challenging? And if you can input your answers, will we be then? Okay, we've got two in. Four, okay. There's no right or wrong answers for this. It's basically just a survey. Okay, and if I can remind everybody that there is a pre-session survey that I've posted along with the link. And if you can complete that, um, it'd be very helpful for us to know where we are at um, with our talk. Okay, um, so we're gonna review the answer. Um, okay, when, okay, that's fine. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, so, thirty-one percent of us um, thought that you know making referrals to other specialties um, is one of the hardest job as an FY one, and I do agree because it can be daunting to speak with consultants from other specialties, especially when you don't know your patient very well. You're on, um, you know, on calls. It's not your typical patient, so um, it's it can be very challenging. Okay. The next poll. Um, which is the last poll um, for um, my first session. Um, which of the following is a factor that may influence medication errors? So um, as an FY1, um, you probably um, need to start um, getting, the, getting the hand of prescribing medication for different patients. And in surgery, your patients are relatively well patients, provided that they can go undergo surgery. They've got, you know, like reasonable amount of resources um, to go under surgery. So what, which of the following is a factor that may influence medication errors? Okay. And this is listed, if I'm not mistaken, in GNC, one of the documents. Um, no, not GNC, in WHO document. So let's review what our audiences think. And we are correct. All of above can contribute to um, medication errors. And um, it is revealed that um, medication error do occur really frequently around 0 to 15% um, of incident reports are medication error, if I'm not mistaken. So, okay, right, I'm gonna go back um, to the slide. Okay, let me stop sharing and go back to the slide and Taz will and tell you about his experiences um, during COVID um, as a surgical FY1. Um, tips of being a surgical FY1, share. And I'm going to full screen mode. Um, oh, it's a bit it's a lagging. Okay, perfect. Okay, right. Um, so, right, Tess, do you want to? Yeah, thanks, Kim, for that. Um, hope everyone can see me. Sorry, it's a bit of a dark background. Um, but so, like I said before, I was um, uh, I'm an F2 at the moment, but I did do most of my FY1 in surgery. Um, so my rotations in surgery were geriatrics for four months, and then I had four months of um, well, meant to be four months of general surgery, and then four months of A&E um, because. Obviously, coronavirus hit uh, the UK. It meant that I had to stay on to do eight months of general surgery. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how it changed um, during coronavirus. So before coronavirus, there was um, it was usually team based. So um, you'd have your it'd be me, and then I have my SHO, my registrar, and my consultant. Um, that was the same across about another I think it was eight teams uh, in total. Um, and you'd have cross cover team as well. So I'd have a cross cover FY1, cross cover SHO, registrar and consultant. So if either one wasn't in, then you could refer to that person for advice if you need. So um, the typical day was, was um, eight to five um, and you'd usually go around doing your ward rounds in the morning um, to see your consultant's patients. Um, and that was how it usually ran um, before coronavirus. Um, you'd also have post eight weeks um, and what that means is basically for the for a week there is um, 
every patient that comes to the hospital is under one consultant uh, for surgery. Um, so if that's A&E referrals, if that's uh, referrals from GP, ward referrals from other wards in the hospital, they all go under one consultant um, for a whole week. Um, so as you can imagine, during that week, you could have 30 to 40 different patients across the whole hospital. Um, so it can be quite busy. Um, that was usually the busiest week of the whole rotation. Um, and then also you have your on-call shifts, which are usually from 8 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m. at night. Um, and you're usually on the admissions ward, which is an SAU, the surgical assessment unit. Um, and you clock in patients, uh, you do your examination, your investigation, you give a management plan, um, and then um, you sort of wait for your senior review, which will be from your registrar. Um, of course, you can use your SHO uh, for advice, and they'll be the one that's taking most of the referrals anyway. Um, so you'll just get a call from your SHO being, oh, there's a patient coming up to SAU, you need to just clock them in, do the examination, and then talk through the management with me. Um, that's sort of how it sort of ran. Um, and then the registrar would come and review the patient as well to make sure that there's nothing missed because they have to be senior reviewed anyway. Um, and then you also have your twilights. So the twilight shifts are from 5 p.m. to 12 um, a.m. Um, this is how it worked at Blackpool anyway. Um, and usually they would run for a whole week. So it's quite a tiring week, to be honest. Um, starts on a Wednesday evening, 5 to 12. Thursday's the same. Uh, Friday's the same. Um, so I've just seen a, a message in the chat, what's SHO and SAU? Um, so SHO is a senior health officer. It's a term that's not really used anymore, um, but it incorporates anyone from an F2. So you start off as F1, doctor, then F2, which is what we are, um, all the way up until registrar, which would be ST3, specialist trainee three. Um, so that includes your core surgical trainees one and two, um, and then you become a registrar. So in that in those um, years, you're all, you're all known as SHOs, basically. Um, uh, where was it? Oh, an SAU is the surgical assessment unit, um, which is where the patients come to be assessed for whether or not they need any kind of surgery or surgical management. Um, and then they get either get discharged or they get admitted to a surgical ward. Um, so that, that, so yeah, so twilight. Um, so on the twilight shift, uh, you're usually um, on your own on the wards, um, but you have your SHO to help you as well. Um, but your SHO is taking the referrals. They're usually very busy with that. They might even get dropped, uh, asked to go to surgery. Um, so you kind of a bit of a lone wolf on the wards, which is a bit scary to begin with. Um, but you, you soon get used to it and you soon um, understand where your limits are and when you need help. And the SHOs are, um, are available to call and for advice. And I'm sure Kim could agree with that as well. Um, they usually are willing to help you and the registrars are willing to help you as well. Um, and if in doubt, just call your registrar. Um, that was that then. Um, and then, yeah, so before uh, COVID as well, there was lots of opportunities to go into theatre. Um, if you were keen to do surgery, like I know Kim is, um, then you can go and ask, be friendly with the, uh, um, the registrars and they'll want you to come into theatre with them, scrub up, do all that kind of stuff. Um, there's lots of opportunities. Um, and you can get involved in research projects as well. Okay, Kim. And then, so now this is when coronavirus hit. Um, so everything just completely changed. Um, we became ward-based. Um, so that's different than being team-based. So I didn't have my own SHO, my own registrar, my own consultant anymore. It was kind of just like, right, you're on this ward um, and you've got all the patients on this ward. So that could be, I think it was about 20, 22 patients or so on one of the wards, um, or maybe even 30 actually. Um, and they're all basically your responsibility. Um, so it made it difficult in terms of cont continuity of care because you didn't really know what was going on with these patients because you haven't been a part of their team. Um, so you kind of had to like read the notes a lot. You had to do a lot of like um, digging on, on what's been going on, what surgery have they had, um, what's the management. You had to call all different kinds of teams different consultants um because you just had no idea what was going on basically um the nurses really liked it though because there was always a doctor available so from their point of view it was a good thing um but for, for, from our point of view i much preferred the team-based um sort of way of doing things again typical day was still eight or five um but there was no more post take weeks because obviously you're ward based now so you didn't have a consultant to do your post take with which meant that 
learning opportunities diminished massively because um, you had a relationship with your registrar, with your consultant. You could learn off them. You could um, go through the pathology together, go through the management plan together. Um, but that was pretty much just scrapped out the window. Um, they cancelled a lot of the elective surgery and it was just emergencies only. Um, so surgery became a lot quieter, I want to say, especially for an F1 point of view anyway, um, which is a good thing for some people, might not be for others. Um, like I said, for the learning type, the aspect of it, it wasn't a useful at all. But um, from like, if you wanted to do your own research, if you wanted to do your own projects, portfolio, you had a lot more time to do that kind of stuff as well. Um, and yeah, you still did your uncles as well as, as normal. Um, but it definitely felt more like service provision now. It felt like they needed the bodies for the ward. So they needed three, three F1s in this ward, two F1s in this ward, two F1s in this ward. Um, and that's, that's just how it was. You just had to do all the kind of jobs that were on the ward then. Um, but yeah, like I said, lack of teaching and learning. And there was literally no uh, theatre opportunities then because as you can imagine, with coronavirus, you had to have all the, the PPE, you had to do all the precautions. So they wanted as little, as many people in theatres as possible. So it meant like FY1s, which are probably not as useful as like an SHO as a registrar in theatre, they just didn't want you to come in basically um, because it's just more chance of you giving the virus away or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, thank you, Kim. Uh, so now a bit about radiology, if anyone's um, interested in radiology like I am. Um, I won't go too much in detail about it, um, but the main ones that I'm going to cover are ultrasound, abdominal x-rays and CT scans, because that's what you see most most of the time, day to day. Um, the special ones are such as like endoscopy, colonoscopy and barium tests, barium, barium enemas, but I won't talk about those today. And then there's a CT scan on the right there. So a bit about ultrasound now. Um, so ultrasounds are, they're the quick uh, test, uh, the gold standard first point of call basically. Um, surgeons love ultrasounds um, because they can give you a result instantly um, and they can be done very quickly basically. Uh, it's usually used for an acute abdomen um, and it's good for things like biliary tree uh, pathology. So gallstones, cholecystitis, things like that. Um, you can see them really well on an ultrasound. Um, you could also see something like an liver abscess, um, perforated appendicitis, hernias, um, anything to do with the right iliac fossa. They like to get an ultrasound because uh, things like gynae pathology as well, um, ovarian cysts, that kind of stuff. You can rule all that stuff out as well. Um, so the causes of right iliac fossa pain, the go-to is always an ultrasound as well. Um, so this might be useful for anyone going into uh, surgery as an FY1. Um, and if always think about an ultrasound first. Um, as the first point of call, um, and we've got I've got an image there. Um, so I know there's a there's a poll now that should be Kim, I think. Um, yeah. So. so we're gonna go back to um, Slido. If um, anybody just join us, um, you can join the poll by logging to um, the app dot do um link and i'm going to share the link now for the next um poll right um go there go there and present mode share right so we're going to go to the next question what does s relate to on the ultrasound and um, so, so before before you one? before you answer this i'll i'll let you know what the little round thing is first so this is an ultrasound of a gallbladder um and the circle that it's pointing to is a gallstone so it's a bit of a tricky question because it's asking what the s is which is the, the line down from the from um so have have a have a have a look at the answers okay have you do do you guys see the option because i don't see it on my screen but um Presumably, okay, no problem. Right, we're still waiting for answers. Um, I'm um, quite aware of the timing, so I'm not gonna wait for all the answers to come in. Um, so, okay. Okay, right, I'm gonna show the right answer. 
And as of now, oh, right, I think it's, it's hidden and underneath, but you should be able to see on your screen and that, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's the Goldstone shadow. Yeah. Uh, that's what that is. Um, okay. I'm a bit conscious of time as well, so I'll, I'll quickly go through um, CT and then abdominal x ray. Um, okay. And then yeah. I'll let um, Kim carry on. Thank you. I'll show the. Um, it's a bit too tricky when you have to change your screen all the time. Um, okay. Share. Uh, so, um, Lewis, how can it be a shadow when there's no light? So ultrasound is to do with sound waves. Um, and it's a good question actually, because you would think well, there's no light involved, um, but it's to do with the density of the gallstone itself. So the sound can't travel through the gallstone as it can do through the walls. So therefore you get less of a, um, like it, it doesn't show up as brighter basically because it can't travel through as well, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so if we just go to the next slide, Kim. So a bit on um, x-rays now. Um, so with x-rays, the evidence is variable. Surgeons don't usually like x-rays, although, which is which people might not understand why, because I know they've done quite a lot, especially in A&E. Um, but one of the main things is why abdominal x-rays aren't that good is because they're 35 times the amount of radiation as a chest x-ray. Um, so you can imagine that's a lot of radiation. And a lot of the time it doesn't exclude what you want it to exclude. So you might see something like on that picture there, which is showing toxic megacolon, uh, which is a complication of ulcerative colitis, um, basically a massive dilated bowel. Um, things like that, which are very rare, it might show. Um, but on the whole, you wouldn't really want to do it an abdominal x-ray if you can help it. Um, the next best step is to just do a CT scan. Um, but things you can see, see are like foreign bodies, perforation, free air, um, some kind of bowel obstruction. Um, I know myself and Kim have probably seen a lot of foreign bodies being on psychiatry, um, but and they're quite interesting as well. I've seen it, I've seen a fork on an X-ray. I've seen batteries. I've seen um, pennies. Um, I've seen all sorts. Um, but yeah, should we go to the CT? Yeah. Um, and then the CT scan. So this is the most diagnostic um, imaging, and it usually tells you the most information. Um, surgeons love this, especially in Blackpool. Um, it's always CT scan, CT scan, CT scan. But some things it's really good for are things like malignancy. Um, you can um, also see obstruction very well on it. Um, anything like cholecystitis, gallstones, which maybe you couldn't see on an ultrasound, you could see on a CT. Um, and of course, these are all reported by radiologists. Um, you might be able to see some um, um, perforation or any free air in the abdomen. Um, and, and hernias as well. And it usually is a good indication as to whether or not surgery is needed. So surgeons like to get a, a CT scan uh, before deciding whether or not they need surgery. If the bowel's twisted, if we need to take, if it's ischemia on the bowel, um, then we need to take it out. So usually CT scan is good at showing those kind of things as well. Um, so just the arrow on the picture, um, does anyone know what that's pointing to uh, on the CT scan? We've got another poll, so um, we're going to go back to share screen. Um, so go back to your Slido, and um, the next question is um, about that scan. So can everybody see on the screen? Yeah. So. The question is, what is the arrow pointing to on the CT scan? Oh, good. Okay, I'm going to show the correct answer. Okay, um, so it's a pancreatic mass um, and most of us got the right answer and um, let's go back to the slide christine just asked how you're able to recognize a hernia from a ct scan good question um and a normal hernia you probably wouldn't see as well as you would an ultrasound um but an incarcerated hernia if there's some bowel involved then you would be able to see that on a ct scan and it's usually 
indicated for if we need to operate on the hernia itself, um, then a CT scan usually tells you like whether or not whether how severe it is basically. Um, but good question. Um, okay, okay, Kim, do you want to carry on? I'll let you carry on. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, um, training pathways in UK. So, um, I did see um, a few um, talks before um, our talk um, was going about um, what are the training pathways. So it's the it's now the time to ask if you've got any um, follow up questions. So basically, there are two main pathways and um, the standard CST coach surgical training pathway, where you do two years of foundation training training, and then you go through a selection progress where you have to show um, your CV and as well as participate in an interview to get the post. Um, and then if you are selected for the job and um, you get into the training program for two years and then you repeat the selection program, which is much more competitive um, than the previous one. And then if you get the national training number, you follow on and train for a good five more years um, and there is the completion of your training certificate. So this applies to um, the listed um, specialties on the brown box and um, just a note for the run-through program. So run-through program basically means that you are more specialized in your, um, you know, right after foundation years, you are more specialized in your ST um, program. And um, you go through ST1 selection, which is far more competitive than CST selection. And then you get a run-through program. It doesn't mean that once you get the SD1, you are safe. And they do have um, assessment um, at different times, depending on which specialty you are um, within SD1 to SD8. And it's not uncommon that um, trainees couldn't finish their training. Um, but it basically takes the same number of years to complete the whole training. And this applies to the um, specialty listed on the right side and um, brown box. And to give you a better idea, I'm going to um, share um, the competition ratio in 2019 and how many people you are competing with and um, in order to get the job. So competition ratios, and if you can see the screen, I am scrolling through. So this includes all other specialties as well, not only surgical specialty, but I'll be focusing on um, the surgical ones. So cardiothoracic surgery in 2019, basically 101 people applied for it and only 12 of them got it. So the ratio is basically 8.4. And um, C and um, cardiothoracic surgery, ST3, is basically after you've completed your CST, you're trying to get into um, the specialty training for that specialty. There was only seven jobs offered and throughout the whole UK. This is not just England, this is UK. Um, and then if we go down, um, core surgical training, and basically in 2019, there were 648 spots altogether in UK, and um, three times the number of candidates applied for that, and thus the competition ratio was three. Um, going down and um, by the way this document's available and um, if you search on google and um, so it's basically um for you to go through in details after this neurosurgery only 24 um, for st1 and three for st3 so you can imagine the competition and you are up against and um, plastic surgery again and um, competition ratio of four and uh, trauma and orthopedic, and um, it's pretty competitive as well. Urology and um, SB3, and um, competition ratio of two. So going back to the slides, and um, oh, before that, we've got a poll um, coming up. If we got time, really quick poll. Um, so if you go back to your and um, we go to the last question. So what was the competition ratio for CST in 2020? Bear in mind that the document that I've just shown um, was 2019. So we are talking about um, just this year and um, what was the competition ratio for CST. So if you can remember, it was three to one um, in 2019. And um, this year it was,
four to one yet. And so competition is tough, but it shouldn't put you off from, um, you know, pursuing a surgical career if that's really what you think and suits you the most. So um, I'm going to quickly finish off the um, presentation. Okay, so MRCS part A and part B, and um, a few of you asked the questions in other um, teaching what they are. It basically stands for membership of Royal College of Surgery. And um, part A is basically like uh, MCQ questions that like you do in your finals. And um, there are eight, 180 questions in paper A and three hours paper, one minute for one question. So you've got to be really quick. And um, principles of surgery in general um, is a, uh, two hour paper where you have 120 questions. So the latest one was done in September, it was done online and you basically get like a break in between the first paper. So the first paper was set in the morning and the second one was set in the afternoon. So it's a full day um, examination. The parsing mark is um, normally 70 to 75%. So it is a tough exam, but it's not impossible to pass it if you've prepared it well. And the passing rate however it's around 40 40 percent um as a whole it's higher in for uk graduates but um, internationally i think it's around 40 percent passing rate and mrcp mrcs part b um, on the other hand is oski they used to have 18 stations before covid happened so the latest one in October, they only had 13 stations and it's basically one minute to read the instruction like you have in, in medical school and um, nine minutes to complete the station. Um, so how do you get ahead in surgery for um, people in the earliest stage of study or um, career? And um, these are the um, specifications and they are basically um, pretty much the same over the past few years, but I'm gonna show you this year's um, criteria um, very quickly. Um, okay, um, application window, so, you applied it through all real oh not login and then um, okay so this year's um, self assessment form is basically um, a, a marking that um, you show how much you have got in your CV and um, it qualifies you to um, participate in the interview, which is basically a 20 minute interview um, where they will assess you and your clinical judgment in a clinical scenario and a leadership management station. Um, so, and these are the details, I won't go into um, too much detail. And so basically, if you can see, um, there they would, ask you to rate yourself um, in terms of um, different specifications listed. So the first one being MRCS, have you passed it? Have you set for it? And um, so if you have not, that basically scores you a zero, but if you have, this probably scores you a one and this probably scores you a two. Um, commitment to, to um, the specialty, have you attended surgical courses like basic surgical skills? I know because of the pandemic, it's a bit difficult to attend these courses, but they are still running, but you just have to book them early. And it is a very expensive course. So um, you've got to have certain um, confidence that surgery is something that you really want to do for you to pursue um, all these courses. And surgical experience, as I said, um, you know, you can start early by doctor documenting all the um, surgery that you have participated in since medical school. And then in FY years, you can do it on e logbook. And basically, you need to be involved in um, 15 cases or more to score a full mark. And then commitment to surgery, have you completed a surgical taster session? And um, it basically, you just have to um, apply for it and go for four to five days of um, a surgical and taste a week and then you can score um, full mark and then um, completion of surgical elective if you have an elective choose um, surgery 
postgraduate um, degrees, have you completed anything else other than your basic medical degree? Have you been awarded any prize, national prize or um, within your medical school? And um, have you completed a QI project on an audit? And you can see in order for you to score fully, you have to lead um, and design and implement. That means more than one cycle, a close loop for you to score a maximal point and present it um, at a regional or national meeting. They are pretty strict on the criteria. So if you have not completed any part of this specification, you couldn't score um, the full mark. And for your teaching experience, you've got to lead and organize and design a teaching program for approximately three months or longer. And you need to have evidence of a formal feedback. And um, these are just um, additional points and presentation. I'm pretty sure somebody's gone through it. Oral presentation is um, it scores you higher than a poster presentation. So if you can try to get an, an oral presentation, publications, um, you know, um, it's not um, easy to get one, but I'm pretty sure there are guidelines out there. Leadership and management get involved in um, things like BMA um, and, you know, you have to hold the position for six or more months and demonstrate a positive impact um, in order for you to score. Right, let's go back. Um, okay, so I think, um, I don't think there is anything else. So, yeah. That is basically um, the end of our presentation and I am going to um, post the link for the post session survey and then we can help and um, to answer some questions um, if we can, if, we uh, if we've got the time. So if, um, yep, so I'll remind it at the end of the session. So let's go through the questions. And um, do you want to start, Tas? Do you want to answer some of the questions? Um, so does the surgical, does the QI audit have to be surgery related? I feel that's more targeted towards you. Okay, um, I'm trying to see. Okay, that's fine. Um, so QI project, I don't think it has to be surgical related for you to score a maximum point. However, um, bear in mind that um, this um, marking system, they do go through and the consultants who will be reviewing you during the interview, they do have information of um, all the evidences and the list that um, you have uploaded on all real. So um, it shows better um, commitment on your CV to surgery if it's surgical related, but no, it doesn't have to be surgery related. Um, okay. I think we've been answering the questions as we went along. So um, I'm, I'm actually a part of a health um, careers. So if anyone wants to ask me a question, they can direct message me um, and I'm happy to answer. Um, so I'm just a bit conscious of time, that's all. Okay, so um, if you still have questions, you can still post in the chat, but if not, um, it would do us a huge favor if you can complete the post session um, survey, which is posted in the link as well. Um, Thank you very much everyone for listening.